Welcome back for our study today in the book of Revelation. I invite you to take your Bible, Revelation chapter 2. We are looking at the church of Pergamos. We've already looked at the Lord's words of commendation, and now he's going to give them some words of confrontation. So let's read Revelation 2, verse 12. It says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, and to commit things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against thee with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone. And in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he, saving he that receiveth it. So when the Savior looks at this church of Pergamos, he finds some things that please him, but not everything is to his liking. So now that we've noticed that we have offered that he's offered them some words of commendation, he now gives them some words of confrontation. And we're not going to get into this in in deep detail because it would take us so long to get through the book of Revelation. I am going to be dealing with this in, in more detail in the commentary on Revelation that I am involved in writing as well that will be released at a later date. But uh, let me just say enough to help you to understand this and that you can dig into it deeper yourself. Uh, as we think about these words of confrontation, first of all, Jesus confronts the compromise in the church in verses 14 and 15. Keep in mind the name Pergamus means thoroughly married, and as we look at what Jesus points out about this church, we are giving a glimpse of a church that is falling into a state of compromise with the world. Here is a church, and it's important for us to understand this because it's also possible to do this today. Here is a church that has held onto pure doctrine with one hand, but with the other, they have embraced the world. They are literally in an unequal yoke with unbelievers, and Jesus confronts them about that in these verses. And here is what he says is wrong with this church of Pergamos. First of all, he tells them there is corruption in the membership. We see that in verse 14 when Jesus tells them that there are some that hold to the doctrine of Balaam. Now, Balaam is one of the strangest individuals in the pages of the Word of God. He's a real mystery. On the one hand, Balaam is a guy who has been intimately acquainted with God. He knew about God, about God's character, and he even talked with God. But on the other hand, he was motivated by greed, and he was guilty of leading the people of God into immorality and idolatry. And we certainly don't have time to read his story, but I encourage you to take time to read Numbers chapter 22 through 25, where you will find the story of Balaam. And in those verses, Bala Balak, the king of Moab, wanted to curse the nation of Israel. So he called for Balaam to come to do that dirty work. And he promises Balaam wealth and promotion for his services. And as you read through those chapters, you'll, you will find out that four times Balaam tries to curse Israel, and each time God turns the curse into a blessing. And when he sees that his attempts to curse them have failed, Balaam apparently suggests to Balak that since they cannot curse Israel, they should corrupt them. And that is accomplished by leading them off into immorality and idolatry and thus bringing the wrath of God upon them. And that's exactly what he does. He says, listen, we can't curse them. So rather than cursing them, let's bring, let's corrupt them and lead them into compromise. And that's exactly what Balaam does. Let me just read a couple of verses out of Numbers. Numbers chapter 25. Numbers chapter 25. And in verse 1, it says this. It says, In Israel bowed in Shechem, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Then in Numbers 31, and in verse 16, it says, Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation with the congregation of the Lord. So there we see, if you cannot curse them, then let's corrupt them. So basically, the doctrine of Balaam is wickedness and worldliness. 
and the church of Pergamos was tolerating people in their midst who claimed to be Christians, but who lived like the world around them. Some of the membership were living immoral lives and participating in pagan worship, and Jesus is not at all pleased with these things. Now, the same problem is rampant in many modern churches today. There are so many who believe that since you are saved by grace and kept by faith, that you can live any way that you please. Friends, it is no wonder that society has lost respect for many churches today. It is no wonder that there is no power in many of the churches today. We live as we please without regard for the clear commands of God in the scriptures. And here's the fact of the matter. If you are saved, you will not live like the world around you. If you are saved, you will walk differently, talk differently, and you will have a different set of standards than the world. If you can adopt the world's standards about substance abuse, about sex, about music, etc., you are most likely not saved. Friends, when God saves a soul, he creates a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He changes everything about that saved person's life. And they are different and they live like they are different. So whether you like it or not, there are some clear standards for living in the word of God. And we can either do them and prove that we are of the truth, or we can ignore them and prove that we are of the darkness. But you cannot have it both ways. If you are saved, you live like you are saved. So there was some there was some corruption in the membership, but there was also confusion in the leadership. Notice in verse 15, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. There were those that held to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Remember back in Revelation chapter 2, verse 6, the word Nicolaitans meant the conquerors of the people. And it probably referred to a priestly class that had developed within the church. But what was deeds in verse 6 has now become doctrine in verse 15. And it started out with the leadership of the church elevating themselves above everyone else, and it turned into a doctrine in that fellowship. And now God has established, and we need to understand, God has established certain offices within the church. And those in those offices are to be respected and listened to if they carry out their office according to the word of God. For example, independent Baptist churches have deacons. They have a biblical office and they are to be respected and honored when they fulfill the demands of that office. If they do not fulfill their obligations, they should resign or they should be asked to step down. We have pastors in our churches. When they preach the word of God and they preach it correctly, you would do well to listen to their message and adjust your life to it. Not because they are simply preaching, but because their office is mandated by the Lord. And in this church, uh, we need to understand um, that there are leaders, but there is also the Lord. And no one in the church is to be worshipped or placed on a high pedestal of honor. We are all under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are all accountable to him. And uh, we need to be careful that leadership does not try to dominate the people. But at the same time, we must always be looking for little dictators that try to get a grip on, the, on power from time to time or try to do things that are not scriptural, like running churches, uh, like businesses. And that is not according to the mandate of the word of God. And then we see, last of all, today that he confronts the consequences for the church. In verse 16, he says, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He tells them to repent. The word repent means a change of mind that literally leads to a change of direction. And if they refuse to repent, he was going to deal with the corruption and confusion in their midst. He is going to come to his church and fight against those who trouble it. Notice a change of pronouns in verse 16. It goes from the to them. Friends, the Lord knows those who belong to him, and he knows those who do not. And he will come to his church and afflict those who are not really his people, but would bring problems and trouble into the church. Those who will not repent are going to have to face the Lord in judgment. Friends, it is a fearful thing to be found on the wrong side of the Lord. It is a dangerous thing to be found fighting against and causing trouble in the church. The Lord loves his church. He loves her so much that he died to redeem her. And he will not idly sit by or stand by while churches are attacked and undermined. What man 
would stand by his wife while she was attacked, either verbally or physically, and allow it to happen. Any man worthy of the name would take his wife's part and defend her, and Jesus Christ will not tolerate those who attack his bride. Tomorrow we'll look at the words of consolation.